Chapter 3 Remnants Vestiges, Embryos, and Bad Design Nothing in biology makes sense, except in the light of evolution. Theodosius Dobshansky In medieval Europe, before there was paper, manuscripts were made by writing on parchment and vellum, thin sheets of dried animal skin. Because these were hard to produce, many medieval writers simply reused earlier texts by scraping off the old words and writing on the newly cleaned pages. These recycled manuscripts are called palimpsests, from the Greek palimpsestos, meaning scraped again. Often, however, minute traces of the earlier writing remained. This has proved critical in our understanding of the ancient world. Many ancient texts are in fact known to us only by peering beneath the stratum of medieval overwriting to recover the original words. Perhaps the most famous of these is the Archimedes palimpsest, first written in Constantinople in the 10th century, and then cleaned and overwritten three centuries later by a monk making a prayer book. In 1906, a Danish classicist identified the original text as the work of Archimedes. Since then, a combination of X-rays, optical character recognition, and other complex methods have been used to decipher the original, underlying text. This painstaking work yielded three mathematical treatises of Archimedes written in ancient Greek, two of them previously unknown and enormously important in the history of science. In such arcane ways we recover the past. Like these ancient texts, Organisms are palimpsests of history, evolutionary history. Within the bodies of animals and plants lie clues to their ancestry, clues that are testimony to evolution. And they are many. Hidden here are special features, vestigial organs, that make sense only as remnants of traits that were once useful in an ancestor. Sometimes we find atavisms, Throwback traits produced by the occasional reawakening of ancestral genes that have long been silenced. Now that we can read DNA sequences directly, we find that species are also molecular palimpsests. In their genomes is inscribed much of their evolutionary history, including the wrecks of genes that once were useful. What's more, in their development from embryos, many species go through contortions of form that are bizarre. Organs and other features appear and then change dramatically or even disappear completely before birth. And species aren't all that well designed either. Many of them show imperfections that are signs not of celestial engineering, but of evolution. Stephen J. Gould called these biological palimpsests the senseless signs of history. But they are not really senseless, for they constitute some of the most powerful evidence for evolution. Vestiges As a graduate student in Boston, I was enlisted to help a senior scientist who had written a paper about whether it was more efficient for warm-blooded animals to run on two legs or four. He planned to submit the paper to Nature, one of the most prestigious scientific journals, and asked me to help him take a photograph striking enough to land on the journal cover and call attention to his work. Eager to get out of the laboratory, I spent an entire afternoon chasing a horse and an ostrich around a corral, hoping to get them to run side by side, demonstrating both types of running in a single frame. Needless to say, the animals refused to cooperate, and, all species being exhausted, we finally gave up. Although we never got the picture, the experience did teach me a biology lesson. Ostriches can't fly, but they can still use their wings. When they're running, they use their wings for balance, extending them to the sides to keep from toppling over. And when an ostrich becomes agitated, as it tends to do when you chase it around a corral, it runs straight at you, extending its wings in a threat display. That's a sign to get out of the way, for a miffed ostrich can easily disembowel you with one swift kick. They also use their wings in mating displays and spread them out to shade their chicks from the harsh African sun. The lesson, though, goes deeper. The wings of the ostrich are a vestigial trait, a feature of a species that was an adaptation in its ancestors 
but that has either lost its usefulness completely or, as in the ostrich, has been co-opted for new uses. Like all flightless birds, ostriches are descended from flying ancestors. We know this from both fossil evidence and from the pattern of ancestry that flightless birds carry in their DNA. But the wings, though still present, can no longer help the birds take flight to forage or escape predators and bothersome graduate students. Yet the wings are not useless. They've evolved new functions. They help the bird maintain balance, mate, and threaten its enemies. The African ostrich isn't the only flightless bird. Besides the ratites, the large flightless birds that include the South American rhea, the Australian emu, and the New Zealand kiwi, dozens of other bird species have independently lost the ability to fly. These include flightless rails, grebes, ducks, and, of course, penguins. Perhaps the most bizarre is the New Zealand kakapo, a tubby, flightless parrot that lives mainly on the ground but can also climb trees and parachute gently to the forest floor. Kakapos are critically endangered. Fewer than 100 still exist in the wild. Because they can't fly, they are easy prey for introduced predators like cats and rats. All flightless birds have wings. In some, like the kiwi, the wings are so small, only a few inches long and buried beneath their feathers, that they don't seem to have any function. They're just remnants. In others, as we saw with the ostrich, the wings have new uses. In penguins, the ancestral wings have evolved into flippers, allowing the bird to swim underwater with amazing speed. Yet they all have exactly the same bones that we see in the wings of species that can fly. That's because the wings of flightless birds weren't the product of deliberate design. Why would a creator use exactly the same bones in flying and flightless wings, including the wings of swimming penguins, but of evolution from flying ancestors? Opponents of evolution always raise the same argument when vestigial traits are cited as evidence for evolution. The features are not useless, they say. They are either useful for something or we haven't yet discovered what they're for. They claim, in other words, that a trait can't be vestigial if it still has a function, or a function yet to be found. But this rejoinder misses the point. Evolutionary theory doesn't say that vestigial characteristics have no function. A trait can be vestigial and functional at the same time. It is vestigial not because it's functionless, but because it no longer performs the function for which it evolved. The wings of an ostrich are useful, but that doesn't mean that they tell us nothing about evolution. Wouldn't it be odd if a creator helped an ostrich balance itself by giving it appendages that just happen to look exactly like reduced wings, and which are constructed in exactly the same way as wings used for flying? Indeed, we expect that ancestral features will evolve new uses. That's just what happens when evolution builds new traits from old ones. Darwin himself noted that an organ rendered during changed habits of life, useless or injurious for one purpose, might easily be modified and used for another purpose. But even when we've established that a trait is vestigial, the questions don't end. In which ancestors was it functional? What was it used for? Why did it lose function? Why is it still there instead of having disappeared completely? And which new functions, if any, has it evolved? Let's take wings again. Obviously, there are many advantages to having wings, advantages shared by the flying ancestors of flightless birds. So why did some species lose their ability to fly? We're not absolutely sure, but we do have some powerful clues. Most of the birds that evolved flightlessness did so on islands the extinct dodo on Mauritius, the Hawaiian rail, the kakapo and kiwi in New Zealand, and the many flightless birds named after the islands they inhabit, the Samoan wood rail, the Gow Island moorhen, the Auckland Island teal, and so on. As we'll see in the next chapter, one of the notable features of remote islands is their lack of mammals and reptiles, species that prey on birds. But what about ratites that live on continents like ostriches? All of these evolved in the southern hemisphere, where there were far fewer mammalian predators than in the north.
The long and short of it is this. Flight is metabolically expensive, using up a lot of energy that could otherwise be diverted to reproduction. If you're flying mainly to stay away from predators, but predators are often missing on islands, or if food is readily obtained on the ground, as it can be on islands, which often lack many trees, then why do you need fully functioning wings? In such a situation, birds with reduced wings would have a reproductive advantage, and natural selection could favor flightlessness. Also, wings are large appendages that are easily injured. If they're unnecessary, you can avoid injury by reducing them. In both situations, selection would directly favor mutations that led to progressively smaller wings, resulting in an inability to fly. So why haven't they disappeared completely? In some cases, they nearly have. The wings of the kiwi are functionless nubs. But when the wings have assumed new uses, as in the ostrich, they will be maintained by natural selection, though in a form that doesn't allow flight. In other species, wings may be in the process of disappearing, and we're simply seeing them in the middle of this process. Vestigial eyes are also common. Many animals, including burrowers and cave dwellers, live in complete darkness. But we know from constructing evolutionary trees that they descended from species that lived above ground and had functioning eyes. Like wings, eyes are a burden when you don't need them. They take energy to build and can be easily injured. So any mutations that favored their loss would clearly be advantageous when it's just too dark to see. Alternatively, mutations that reduced vision could simply accumulate over time if they neither helped nor hurt the animal. Just such an evolutionary loss of eyes occurred in the ancestor of the eastern Mediterranean blind mole rat. This is a long cylindrical rodent with stubby legs resembling a fur-covered salami with a tiny mouth. This creature spends its entire life underground, Yet it still retains a vestige of an eye, a tiny organ only one millimeter across and completely hidden beneath a protective layer of skin. The remnant eye can't form images. Molecular evidence tells us that, around 25 million years ago, blind mole rats evolved from sighted rodents, and their withered eyes attest to this ancestry. But why do these remnants remain at all? Recent studies show that they contain a photopigment that is sensitive to low levels of light and helps regulate the animal's daily rhythm of activity. This residual function, driven by small amounts of light that penetrate underground, could explain the persistence of vestigial eyes. True moles, which are not rodents but insectivores, have independently lost their eyes, retaining only a vestigial, skin-covered organ that you can see by pushing aside the fur on its head. Similarly, in some burrowing snakes, the eyes are completely hidden beneath the scales. Many cave animals also have eyes that are reduced or missing. These include fish, like the blind cave fish you can buy at pet stores, spiders, salamanders, shrimp, and beetles. There is even a blind cave crayfish, that still has eye stalks but no eyes atop them. Whales are treasure troves of vestigial organs. Many living species have a vestigial pelvis and leg bones, testifying, as we saw in the last chapter, to their descent from four-legged terrestrial ancestors. If you look at a complete whale skeleton in a museum, you'll often see the tiny hind limb and pelvic bones hanging from the rest of the skeleton, suspended by wires. That's because in living whales, they're not connected to the rest of the bones, but are simply embedded in tissue. They once were part of the skeleton, but became disconnected and tiny when they were no longer needed. The list of vestigial organs in animals could fill a large catalog. Darwin himself, an avid beetle collector in his youth, pointed out that some flightless beetles still have vestiges of wings beneath their fused wing covers. The beetle's shell. We humans have many vestigial features, proving that we evolved. The most famous is the appendix. Known medically as the vermiform, worm-shaped appendix, it's a thin, pencil-sized cylinder of tissue that forms the end of the pouch, or cecum, that sits at the junction of our large and small intestines. 
Like many vestigial features, its size and degree of development are highly variable. In humans, its length ranges from about an inch to over a foot. A few people are even born without one. In herbivorous animals like koalas, rabbits, and kangaroos, the cecum and its appendix tip are much larger than ours. This is also true of leaf-eating primates like lemurs, lorises, and spider monkeys. The enlarged pouch serves as a fermenting vessel, like the extra stomachs of cows, containing bacteria that help the animal break down cellulose into usable sugars. In primates whose diet includes fewer leaves, like orangutans and macaques, the cecum and appendix are reduced. In humans, who don't eat leaves and can't digest cellulose, the appendix is nearly gone. Obviously, the less herbivorous the animal, the smaller the cecum and appendix. In other words, our appendix is simply the remnant of an organ that was critically important to our leaf-eating ancestors, but of no real value to us. Does an appendix do us any good at all? If so, it's not obvious. Removing it doesn't produce any bad side effects or increase mortality. In fact, removal seems to reduce the incidence of colitis. Discussing the appendix in his famous textbook, The Vertebrate Body, the paleontologist Alfred Romer remarked dryly, Its major importance would appear to be financial support of the surgical profession. But to be fair, it may be of some small use. The appendix contains patches of tissue that may function as part of the immune system. It has also been suggested that it provides a refuge for useful gut bacteria when an infection removes them from the rest of our digestive system. But these minor benefits are surely outweighed by the severe problems that come with the human appendix. Its narrowness makes it easily clogged, which can lead to its infection and inflammation, otherwise known as appendicitis. If not treated, a ruptured appendix can kill you. You have about one chance in fifteen of getting appendicitis in your lifetime. Fortunately, thanks to the evolutionarily recent practice of surgery, the chance of dying when you get appendicitis is only one percent. But before doctors began to remove inflamed appendices in the late nineteenth century, mortality may have exceeded twenty percent. In other words, before the days of surgical removal, more than one person in a hundred died of appendicitis. That's pretty strong natural selection. Over the vast period of human evolution, more than 99% of it, there were no surgeons, and we lived with a ticking time bomb in our gut. When you weigh the tiny advantages of an appendix against its huge disadvantages, it's clear that on the whole it is simply a bad thing to have. But apart from whether it's good or bad, the appendix is still vestigial, for it no longer performs the function for which it evolved. So why do we still have one? We don't yet know the answer. It may, in fact, have been on its way out, but surgery has almost eliminated natural selection against people with appendices. Another possibility is that selection simply can't shrink the appendix any more without it becoming even more harmful. A smaller appendix may run an even higher risk of being blocked. That might be an evolutionary roadblock to its complete disappearance. Our bodies teem with other remnants of primate ancestry. We have a vestigial tail, the coccyx, or the triangular end of our spine that's made of several fused vertebrae hanging below our pelvis. It's what remains of the long, useful tail of our ancestors. Note. See figure 14. It still has a function, some useful muscles attached to it, but remember that its vestigiality is diagnosed not by its usefulness, but because it no longer has the function for which it originally evolved. Tellingly, some humans have a rudimentary tail muscle, the extensor coccygis, identical to the one that moves the tails of monkeys and other mammals. It still attaches to our coccyx, but since the bones can't move, the muscle is useless. You may have one and not even know it. Other vestigial muscles become apparent in winter or at horror movies. These are the erector pili, the tiny muscles that attach to the base of each body hair. 
When they contract, the hairs stand up, giving us goosebumps, so called because of their resemblance to the skin of a plucked goose. Goosebumps and the muscles that make them serve no useful function, at least in humans. In other mammals, however, they raise the fur for insulation when it's cold and cause the animal to look larger when it's making or receiving threats. Think of a cat whose fur brushes out when it's cold or angry. Our vestigial goosebumps are produced by exactly the same stimuli, cold or a rush of adrenaline. And here's a final example. If you can wiggle your ears, you're demonstrating evolution. We have three muscles under our scalp that attach to our ears. In most individuals, they're useless, but some people can use them to wiggle their ears. I am one of the lucky ones, and every year demonstrate this prowess to my evolution class, much to the student's amusement. These are the same muscles used by other animals, like cats and horses, to move their ears around, helping them localize sounds. In those species, moving the ears helps them detect predators, locate their young, and so on. But in humans, the muscles are good only for entertainment. To paraphrase the quote from the geneticist Theodosius Dobshansky that begins this chapter, vestigial traits make sense only in the light of evolution, sometimes useful, but often not. They're exactly what we'd expect to find if natural selection gradually eliminated useless features or refashioned them into new, more adaptive ones. Tiny, non-functional wings, a dangerous appendix, Eyes that can't see and silly ear muscles simply don't make sense if you think that species were specially created. Atavisms Occasionally, an individual crops up with an anomaly that looks like the reappearance of an ancestral trait. A horse can be born with extra toes, a human baby with a tail. These sporadically expressed remnants of ancestral features are called atavisms, from the Latin atavis, or ancestor. They differ from vestigial traits because they occur only occasionally, rather than in every individual. True atavisms must recapitulate an ancestral trait, and in a fairly exact way. They aren't simply monstrosities. A human born with an extra leg, for example, is not an atavism, because none of our ancestors had five limbs. The most famous genuine atavisms are probably the legs of whales. We've already learned that some species of whales retain vestigial pelvises and rear leg bones, but about one whale in 500 is actually born with a rear leg that protrudes outside the body wall. These limbs show all degrees of refinement, with many of them clearly containing the major leg bones of terrestrial mammals, the femur, tibia, and fibula. Some even have feet and toes. Why do atavisms like this occur at all? Our best hypothesis is that they come from the re-expression of genes that were functional in ancestors, but were silenced by natural selection when they were no longer needed. Yet these dormant genes can sometimes be reawakened when something goes awry in development. Whales still contain some genetic information for making legs, not perfect legs since the information has degraded during the millions of years that it resided unused in the genome, but legs nonetheless. And that information is there because whales descended from four-legged ancestors. Like the ubiquitous whale pelvis, the rare whale leg, is evidence for evolution. Modern horses, which descend from smaller, five-toed ancestors, show similar atavisms. The fossil record documents the gradual loss of toes over time, so that in modern horses only the middle one, the hoof, remains. It turns out that horse embryos begin development with three toes, which grow at equal rates, Later, however, the middle toe begins to grow faster than the other two, which at birth are left as thin splint bones along either side of the leg. Splint bones are true vestigial features. When they become inflamed, a horse gets the splints. On rare occasions, though, the extra digits continue developing until they become true extra toes, complete with hoofs. Often these atavistic toes don't touch the ground unless the horse is running 
This is exactly what the ancient horse, Merikippus, looked like fifteen million years ago. Extra-toed horses were once considered supernatural wonders. Both Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great were said to have ridden them. And they are wonders of a sort, wonders of evolution, for they clearly show genetic kinship between ancient and modern horses. The most striking atavism in our own species is called the coxygeal projection, better known as the human tail. As we'll learn shortly, early in development human embryos have a sizable fish-like tail, which begins to disappear about seven weeks into development. Its bones and tissues are simply reabsorbed by the body. Rarely, however, it doesn't regress completely, and a baby is born with a tail projecting from the base of its spine, figure 14. The tails vary tremendously. Some are soft without bone, while others contain vertebrae, the same vertebrae normally fused together in our tailbone. Some tails are an inch long, others nearly a foot, and they aren't just simple flaps of skin, but can have hair, muscles, blood vessels, and nerves. Some can even wiggle. Fortunately, these awkward protrusions are easily removed by surgeons. What could this mean, other than that we still carry a developmental program for making tails? Indeed, recent genetic work has shown that we carry exactly the same genes that make tails in animals like mice, but these genes are normally deactivated in human fetuses. Tails appear to be true atavisms. Some atavisms can be produced in the laboratory. The most amazing of these is that paragon of rarity, hen's teeth. In 1980, E. J. Kohler and C. Fisher at the University of Connecticut combined the tissues of two species, grafting the tissue lining the mouth of a chicken embryo on top of tissue from the jaw of a developing mouse. Amazingly, the chicken tissue eventually produced tooth-like structures, some with distinct roots and crowns. Since the underlying mouse tissue alone could not produce teeth, Kohler and Fisher inferred that molecules from the mouse reawakened a dormant developmental program for making teeth in chickens. This meant that chickens had all the right genes for making teeth, but were missing a spark that the mouse tissue was able to provide. Twenty years later, scientists unraveled the molecular biology and showed that Kohler and Fisher's suggestion was right. Birds do indeed have genetic pathways for producing teeth but don't make them because a single crucial protein is missing. When that protein is supplied, tooth-like structures form on the bill. You'll remember that birds evolved from toothed reptiles. They lost those teeth more than 60 million years ago, but clearly still carry some genes for making them, genes that are remnants of their reptilian ancestry. Dead Genes Atavisms and vestigial traits show us that when a trait is no longer used or becomes reduced, the genes that make it don't instantly disappear from the genome. Evolution stops their action by inactivating them, not snipping them out of the DNA. From this we can make a prediction. We expect to find, in the genomes of many species, silenced or dead genes genes that once were useful but are no longer intact or expressed. In other words, there should be vestigial genes. In contrast, the idea that all species were created from scratch predicts that no such genes would exist, since there would be no common ancestors in which those genes were active. Thirty years ago, we couldn't test this prediction because we had no way to read the DNA code. Now, however, it's quite easy to sequence the complete genome of species, and it's been done for many of them, including humans. This gives us a unique tool to study evolution when we realize that the normal function of a gene is to make a protein, a protein whose sequence of amino acids is determined by the sequence of nucleotide bases that make up the DNA. And once we have the DNA sequence of a given gene, we can usually tell if it is expressed normally. That is, whether it makes a functional protein, or whether it is silenced and makes nothing. We can see, for example, whether mutations have changed the gene so that a usable protein can no longer be made. 
or whether the control regions responsible for turning on a gene have been inactivated. A gene that doesn't function is called a pseudogene. And the evolutionary prediction that we'll find pseudogenes has been fulfilled amply. Virtually every species harbors dead genes, many of them still active in its relatives. This implies that those genes were also active in a common ancestor and were killed off in some descendants but not in others. Out of about 30,000 genes, for example, we humans carry more than 2,000 pseudogenes. Our genome and that of other species are truly well-populated graveyards of dead genes. The most famous human pseudogene is GLO, so-called because in other species it produces an enzyme called L-gulano-gamma-lactone oxidase. This enzyme is used in making vitamin C, ascorbic acid, from the simple sugar glucose. Vitamin C is essential for proper metabolism, and virtually all mammals have the pathway to make it. All, that is, except for primates, fruit bats, and guinea pigs. In these species, vitamin C is obtained directly from their food, and normal diets usually have enough. If we don't ingest enough vitamin C, we get sick. Scurvy was common among fruit-deprived seamen of the 19th century. The reason why primates and these few other mammals don't make their own vitamin C is because they don't need to. Yet DNA sequencing tells us that primates still carry most of the genetic information needed to make the vitamin. It turns out that the pathway for making vitamin C from glucose involves a sequence of four steps, each promoted by the product of a different gene. Primates and guinea pigs still have active genes for the first three steps, but the last step, which requires the GLO enzyme, doesn't take place. GLO has been inactivated by a mutation. It has become a pseudogene, called Psi-GLO. Psi is the Greek letter, PSI, standing for pseudo. Psi-GLO doesn't work because a single nucleotide in the gene's DNA sequence is missing and it's exactly the same nucleotide missing in other primates. This shows that the mutation that destroyed our ability to make vitamin C was present in the ancestor of all primates and was passed on to its descendants. The inactivation of GLO in guinea pigs happened independently, since it involves different mutations. It's highly likely that since fruit bats, guinea pigs, and primates got plenty of vitamin C in their diet, there was no penalty for inactivating the pathway that made it. This could even have been beneficial, since it eliminated a protein that might have been costly to produce. A dead gene in one species that is active in its relatives is evidence for evolution. But there's more. When you look at side GLO in living primates, you find out that its sequence is more similar between close relatives than between more distant ones. The sequences of human and chimp psi GLO, for example, resemble each other closely, but differ more from the psi GLO of orangutans, which are more distant relatives. What's more, the sequence of guinea pig psi GLO is very different from that of all primates. Only evolution and common ancestry can explain these facts. All mammals inherited a functional copy of the GLO gene. About 40 million years ago, in the common ancestor of all primates, a gene that was no longer needed was inactivated by a mutation. All primates inherited that same mutation. After GLO was silenced, other mutations continued to occur in the gene that was no longer expressed. These mutations accumulated over time. They are harmless if they occur in genes that are already dead, and were passed on to descendant species. Since closer relatives share a common ancestor more recently, genes that change in a time-dependent way follow the pattern of common ancestry, leading to DNA sequences more similar in close than in distant relatives. This occurs whether or not a gene is dead. The sequence of Psi GLO in guinea pigs is so different because it was inactivated independently, in a lineage that had already diverged from that of primates. And Psi GLO is not unique in showing such patterns. There are many other such pseudogenes.
But if you believe that primates and guinea pigs were specially created, these facts don't make sense. Why would a creator put a pathway for making vitamin C in all these species and then inactivate it? Wouldn't it be easier simply to omit the whole pathway from the beginning? Why would the same inactivating mutation be present in all primates and a different one in guinea pigs? Why would the sequences of the dead gene exactly mirror the pattern of resemblance predicted from the known ancestry of these species? And why do humans have thousands of pseudogenes in the first place? We also harbor dead genes that came from other species, namely viruses. Some, called endogenous retroviruses, can make copies of their genome and insert them into the DNA of species they infect. HIV is a retrovirus. If the viruses infect the cells that make sperm and eggs, they can be passed on to future generations. The human genome contains thousands of such viruses, nearly all of them rendered harmless by mutations. They are the remnants of ancient infections, but some of these remnants sit in exactly the same location on the chromosomes of humans and chimpanzees. These were surely viruses that infected our common ancestor and were passed on to both descendants. Since there is almost no chance of viruses inserting themselves independently at exactly the same spot in two species, this points strongly to common ancestry. Another curious tale of dead genes involves our sense of smell, or rather, our poor sense of smell, for humans are truly bad sniffers among land mammals. Nevertheless, we can still recognize more than 10,000 different odors. How can we accomplish such a feat? Until recently, this was a complete mystery. The answer lies in our DNA, in our many olfactory receptor, OR, genes. The OR story was worked out by Linda Buck and Richard Axel, who were awarded the Nobel Prize for this feat in 2004. Let's look at OR genes in a super sniffer, the mouse. Mice depend heavily on their sense of smell, not only to find food and avoid predators, but also to detect one another's pheromones. The sensory world of a mouse is vastly different from ours, in which vision is far more important than smell. Mice have about a thousand active OR genes. All of them descend from a single ancestral gene that arose millions of years ago and became duplicated many times, so that each gene differs slightly from the others. And each produces a different protein, an olfactory receptor that recognizes a different airborne molecule. Each OR protein is expressed in a different type of receptor cell in the tissues lining the nose. Different odors contain different combinations of molecules, and each combination stimulates a different group of cells. The cell sends signals to the brain, which integrates and decodes the different signals. That's how mice can distinguish the smell of cats from that of cheese. By integrating combinations of signals, mice and other mammals can recognize far more odors than they have OR genes. The ability to recognize different smells is useful. It enables you to distinguish kin from non-kin, find a mate, locate food, recognize predators, and see who has been invading your territory. The survival advantages are enormous. How has natural selection tapped them? First, an ancestral gene became duplicated a number of times. Such duplication happens from time to time as an accident during cell division. Gradually, the duplicated copies diverged from each other, with each binding to a different odor molecule. A different type of cell evolved for each of the thousand OR genes, and at the same time, the brain became rewired to combine the signals from the various kinds of cells to create the sensations of different odors. This is a truly staggering feat of evolution, driven by the sheer survival value of the discerning sniff. Our own sense of smell comes nowhere close to that of mice. One reason is that we express fewer OR genes, only about 400. But we still carry a total of 800 OR genes, which make up nearly 3% of our entire genome and fully half of these are pseudogenes, permanently inactivated by mutations. 
The same is true for most other primates. How did this happen? Probably because we primates, who are active during the day, rely more on vision than on smell, and so don't need to discriminate among so many odors. Unneeded genes eventually get bumped off by mutations. Predictably, primates with color vision, and hence greater discrimination of the environment, have more dead OR genes. If you look at the sequences of human OR genes, both active and inactive, they are most similar to those of other primates, less similar to those of primitive mammals like the platypus, and less similar yet to the OR genes of distant relatives like reptiles. Why should dead genes show such a relationship if not for evolution? And the fact that we harbor so many inactive genes is even more evidence for evolution. We carry this genetic baggage because it was needed in our distant ancestors, who relied for survival on a keen sense of smell. But the most striking example of the evolution or de-evolution of OR genes is the dolphin. Dolphins don't need to detect volatile odors in the air, since they do their business underwater, and they have a completely different set of genes for detecting waterborne chemicals. As one might predict, OR genes of dolphins are inactivated. In fact, 80% of them are inactivated. Hundreds of them still sit silently in the dolphin genome, mute testimony of evolution. And if you look at the DNA sequences of these dead dolphin genes, you'll find that they resemble those of land mammals. This makes sense when we realize that dolphins evolved from land mammals whose OR genes became useless when they took to the water. This makes no sense if dolphins were specially created. Vestigial genes can go hand in hand with vestigial structures. We mammals evolved from reptilian ancestors that laid eggs. With the exceptions of the monotremes, the order of mammals that include the Australian spiny anteater and duck-billed platypus, mammals have dispensed with egg-laying, and mothers nourish their young directly through the placenta instead of by providing a storehouse of yolk. And mammals carry three genes that, in reptiles and birds, produce the nutritious protein vitalogenin, which fills the yolk sac. But in virtually all mammals, these genes are dead, totally inactivated by mutations. Only the egg-laying monotremes still produce vitalogenin, having one active and two dead genes. What's more, mammals like ourselves still produce a yolk sac, but one that is vestigial and yolkless, a large, fluid-filled balloon attached to the fetal gut. Note, see figure 15. In the second month of human pregnancy, it detaches from the embryo. With its duck-like bill, fat tail, poison-tipped spurs on the hind legs of males, and the ability of females to lay eggs, the platypus of Australia is bizarre in many ways. If ever a creature seems unintelligently designed, or perhaps devised for a creator's amusement, it would be this one. But the platypus has one more odd feature. It lacks a stomach. Unlike nearly all vertebrates, who have a pouch-like stomach in which digestive enzymes break down food, the platypus' stomach is just a slight swelling of the esophagus, where it joins the intestine. This stomach completely lacks the glands that produce digestive enzymes in other vertebrates. We're not sure why evolution has eliminated the stomach. Perhaps the platypus diet of soft insects doesn't require much processing. But we know that the platypus came from ancestors with stomachs. One reason is that the platypus genome contains two pseudogenes for enzymes related to digestion. No longer needed, they've become inactivated by mutation, but still testify to the evolution of this strange beast. Palimpsests in Embryos Well before the time of Darwin, biologists were busy studying both embryology, how an animal develops, and comparative anatomy, the similarities and differences in the structure of different animals. Their work turned up many peculiarities that, at the time, didn't make sense. For example, all vertebrates begin development in the same way, looking rather like an embryonic fish. As development proceeds, different species begin to diverge, but in weird ways. 
some blood vessels, nerves, and organs that were present in the embryos of all species at the start suddenly disappear, while others go through strange contortions and migrations. Eventually, the dance of development culminates in the very different adult forms of fish, reptiles, birds, amphibians, and mammals. Nevertheless, when development begins, they look very much alike. Darwin tells the story of how the great German embryologist, Karl Ernst von Baer, became confused by the similarity of vertebrate embryos. Von Baer wrote to Darwin, In my possession are two little embryos in spirit, alcohol, whose names I have omitted to attach, and at present I am quite unable to say to what class they belong. They may be lizards or small birds or very young mammalia. So complete is the similarity in the mode of formation of the head and trunk in these animals. And again, it was Darwin who reconciled the disparate facts about embryology that filled the textbooks of his time and showed that the puzzling features of development suddenly made perfect sense under the unifying idea of evolution. Embryology rises greatly in interest when we thus look at the embryo as a picture, more or less obscured, of the common parent form of each great class of animals. Let's start with that fishy fetus of all vertebrates, limbless and sporting a fish-like tail. Perhaps the most striking fish-like feature is a series of five to seven pouches separated by grooves that lie on each side of the embryo near its future head. These pouches are called the branchial arches, but we'll call them arches for short. Note, see figure 16. Each arch contains tissues that develop into nerves, blood vessels, muscles, and bone or cartilage. As fish and shark embryos develop, the first arch becomes the jaw, and the rest become gill structures. The clefts between the pouches open up to become the gill slits, and the pouches develop nerves to control the movement of the gills. Blood vessels to remove oxygen from water, and bars of bone or cartilage to support the gill structure. In fish and sharks, then, the development of gills from the embryonic arches is more or less direct. These embryonic features simply enlarge without much change to form the adult breathing apparatus. But in other vertebrates that don't have gills as adults, these arches turn into very different structures, structures that make up the head. In mammals, for example, they form the three tiny bones of the middle ear, the eustachian tube, the carotid artery, the tonsils, the larynx, and the cranial nerves. Sometimes the embryonic gill slits fail to close in human embryos, producing a baby with a cyst on its neck. This condition, an atavistic remnant of our fishy ancestors, can be corrected with surgery. Our blood vessels go through especially strange contortions. In fish and sharks, the embryonic pattern of vessels develops without much change into the adult system. But as other vertebrates develop, the vessels move around and some of them disappear. Mammals like ourselves are left with only three main vessels from the original six. The really curious thing is that as our development proceeds, the changes resemble an evolutionary sequence. Our fish-like circulatory system turns into one similar to that of embryonic amphibians. In amphibians, the embryonic vessels turn directly into adult vessels, but ours continue to change, into a circulatory system resembling that of embryonic reptiles. In reptiles, this system then develops directly into the adult one, but ours changes still further, adding a few more twists that turn it into a true mammalian circulatory system, complete with carotid, pulmonary, and dorsal arteries. Note, see figure 17. These patterns raise a lot of questions. First, why do different vertebrates, which wind up looking very different from one another, all begin development looking like a fish embryo? Why do mammals form their heads and faces from the very same embryonic structures that become the gills of fish? Why do vertebrate embryos go through such a contorted sequence of changes in the circulatory system? Why don't human embryos, 
or lizard embryos begin development with their adult circulatory system already in place, rather than making a lot of changes in what developed earlier? And why does our sequence of development mimic the order of our ancestors, fish to amphibian to reptile to mammal? As Darwin argued in The Origin, it's not because human embryos experience a series of environments during development to which they must successively adapt, first a fish-like one, then a reptilian one, and so on. The points of structure in which the embryos of widely different animals of the same class resemble each other often have no direct relation to their conditions of existence. We cannot, for instance, suppose that in the embryos of the vertebra, the peculiar loop-like course of the arteries near the branchial slits are related to similar conditions. In the young mammal which is nourished in the womb of its mother, in the egg of the bird which is hatched in a nest, and in the spawn of a frog under water. The recapitulation of an evolutionary sequence is seen in the developmental sequence of other organs, our kidneys, for example. During development, the human embryo actually forms three different types of kidneys, one after the other, with the first two discarded before our final kidney appears. And those transitory embryonic kidneys are similar to those we find in species that evolved before us in the fossil record, jawless fish and reptiles, respectively. What does this mean? You could answer this question superficially as follows. Each vertebrate undergoes development in a series of stages, and the sequence of those stages happens to follow the evolutionary sequence of its ancestors. So, for example, a lizard begins development resembling an embryonic fish, then somewhat later an embryonic amphibian, and finally an embryonic reptile. Mammals go through the same sequence but add on the final stage of an embryonic mammal. This answer is correct but only raises deeper issues. Why does development often occur in this way? Why doesn't natural selection eliminate the fish embryo stage of human development, since a combination of a tail, fish-like gill arches, and a fish-like circulatory system doesn't seem necessary for a human embryo? Why don't we simply begin development as tiny humans, as some 17th century biologists thought we did, and just get larger and larger until we're born? Why all the transformation and rearrangement? The probable answer, and it's a good one, involves recognizing that as one species evolves into another, the descendant inherits the developmental program of its ancestor, that is, all the genes that form ancestral structures. And development is a very conservative process. Many structures that form later in development require biochemical cues from features that appear earlier. If, for example, you try to tinker with the circulatory system by remodeling it from the very onset of development, you might produce all sorts of adverse side effects in the formation of other structures, like bones, that mustn't be changed. To avoid these deleterious side effects, it's usually easier to simply tack some less drastic changes onto what is already a robust and basic developmental plan. It is best for things that evolve later to be programmed to develop later in the embryo. This adding new stuff onto old principle also explains why the sequence of developmental changes mirrors the evolutionary sequence of organisms. As one group evolves from another, it often adds its development program on top of the old one. Noting this principle, Ernst Haeckel a German evolutionist and Darwin's contemporary, formulated a biogenic law in 1866, famously summarized as ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This means that the development of an organism simply replays its evolutionary history. But this notion is true in only a limited sense. Embryonic stages don't look like the adult forms of their ancestors, as Haeckel claimed but like the embryonic forms of ancestors. Human fetuses, for example, never resemble adult fish or reptiles, but in certain ways they do resemble embryonic fish and reptiles. Also, the recapitulation is neither strict nor inevitable. Not every feature of an ancestor's embryo appears in its descendants, 
nor do all stages of development unfold in a strict evolutionary order. Further, some species, like plants, have dispensed with nearly all traces of their ancestry during development. Heckel's law has fallen into disrepute, not only because it wasn't strictly true, but also because Heckel was accused, largely unjustly, of fudging some drawings of early embryos to make them look more similar than they really are. Yet we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Embryos still show a form of recapitulation. Features that arose earlier in evolution often appear earlier in development. And this makes sense only if species have an evolutionary history. Now, we're not absolutely sure why some species retain much of their evolutionary history during development. The adding new stuff onto old principle is just a hypothesis, an explanation for the facts of embryology. It's hard to prove that it was easier for a developmental program to evolve one way rather than another. But the facts of embryology remain and make sense only in light of evolution. All vertebrates begin development looking like embryonic fish because we all descended from a fish-like ancestor with a fish-like embryo. We see strange contortions and disappearances of organs, blood vessels, and gill slits because descendants still carry the genes and developmental programs of ancestors. And the sequence of developmental changes also makes sense at one stage of development, mammals have an embryonic circulatory system like that of reptiles, but we don't see the converse situation. Why? Because mammals descended from early reptiles and not vice versa. When he wrote The Origin, Darwin considered embryology his strongest evidence for evolution. Today, he'd probably give pride of place to the fossil record. Nevertheless, science continues to accumulate intriguing features about development that support evolution. Embryonic whales and dolphins form hind limb buds, bulges of tissue that in four-legged mammals become the rear legs. But in marine mammals, the buds are reabsorbed soon after they're formed. Figure 18 shows this regression in the development of the spotted dolphin. Baleen whales which lack teeth but whose ancestors were toothed whales, develop embryonic teeth that disappear before birth. One of my favorite cases of embryological evidence for evolution is the furry human fetus. We are famously known as naked apes because, unlike other primates, we don't have a thick coat of hair. But in fact, for one brief period we do, as embryos, Around six months after conception, we become completely covered with a fine, downy coat of hair called lanugo. Lanugo is usually shed about a month before birth, when it's replaced by the more sparsely distributed hair with which we're born. Premature infants, however, are sometimes born with lanugo, which soon falls off. Now there's no need for a human embryo to have a transitory coat of hair. After all, it's a cozy 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit in the womb. The nugo can be explained only as a remnant of our primate ancestry. Fetal monkeys also develop a coat of hair at about the same stage of development. Their hair, however, doesn't fall out, but hangs on to become the adult coat. And like humans, fetal whales also have lanugo, a remnant of when their ancestors lived on land. The final example from humans takes us into the realm of speculation, but it is too appealing to omit. This is the grasping reflex of newborn babies. If you have access to an infant, gently stroke the palms of its hands. The baby will show a reflex response by making a fist around your finger. In fact, the grasp is so tight that an infant can, using both hands, hang for several minutes from a broomstick. Warning, don't try this experiment at home. The grasping reflex, which disappears several months after birth, may well be an atavistic behavior. Newborn monkeys and apes have the same reflex, but it persists throughout the juvenile stage, allowing the young to hang on to their mother's fur as they're carried about. It is sad that while embryology provides such a gold mine of evidence for evolution, Textbooks of embryology often fail to point this out. 
I have met obstetricians, for instance, who know everything about the lanugo except why it appears in the first place. As well as peculiarities of embryonic development, there are also peculiarities of animal structure that can be explained only by evolution. These are cases of bad design. Bad Design In the otherwise forgettable movie, Man of the Year, comedian Robin Williams plays a television talk show host who, through a series of bizarre accidents, becomes President of the United States. During a pre-election debate, Williams' character is asked about intelligent design. He responds, People say intelligent design. We must teach intelligent design. Look at the human body. Is that intelligent? You have a waste processing plant next to a recreation area. It's a good point. Although organisms appear designed to fit their natural environments, the idea of perfect design is an illusion. Every species is imperfect in many ways. Kiwis have useless wings, whales have a vestigial pelvis, and our appendix is a nefarious organ. What I mean by bad design is the notion that if organisms were built from scratch by a designer, one who used the biological building blocks of nerves, muscles, bone, and so on, they would not have such imperfections. Perfect design would truly be the sign of a skilled and intelligent designer. Imperfect design is the mark of evolution. In fact, it's precisely what we expect from evolution. We've learned that evolution doesn't start from scratch. New parts evolve from old ones and have to work well with the parts that have already evolved. Because of this, we should expect compromises, some features that work pretty well but not as well as they might, or some features, like the kiwi wing, that don't work at all but are evolutionary leftovers. A good example of bad design is the flounder, whose popularity as an eating fish, Dover sole, for instance, comes partly from its flatness, which makes it easy to bone. There are actually about 500 species of flatfish, halibut, turbo, flounders, and their kin, all placed in the order Pleuronectiformes. The word means side swimmers, a description that's the key to their poor design. Flatfish are born as normal-looking fish that swim vertically, with one eye placed on each side of a pancake-shaped body. But a month thereafter, a strange thing happens— one eye begins to move upward. It migrates over the skull and joins the other eye to form a pair of eyes on one side of the body, either right or left, depending on the species. The skull also changes its shape to promote this movement, and there are changes in the fins in color. In concert, the flat fish tips onto its newly eyeless side so that both eyes are now on top. It becomes a flat, camouflaged bottom dweller that preys on other fish. When it has to swim, it does so on its side. Flatfish are the world's most asymmetrical vertebrates. Check out a specimen the next time you go to the fish market. If you wanted to design a flatfish, you wouldn't do it this way. You'd produce a fish like the skate, which is flat from birth and lies on its belly not one that has to achieve flatness by lying on its side, moving its eyes and deforming its skull. Flatfish are poorly designed. But the poor design comes from their evolutionary heritage. We know from their family tree that flounders, like all flatfish, evolved from normal, symmetrical fish. Evidently, they found it advantageous to tip onto their sides and lie on the seafloor, hiding themselves from both predators and prey. This, of course, created a problem. The bottom eye would be both useless and easily injured. To fix this, natural selection took the torturous but available route of moving its eye about, as well as otherwise deforming its body. One of nature's worst designs is shown by the recurrent laryngeal nerve of mammals. Running from the brain to the larynx, this nerve helps us speak and swallow. The curious thing is that it is much longer than it needs to be. Rather than taking a direct route from the brain to the larynx, a distance of about a foot in humans, the nerve runs down into your chest, loops around the aorta and a ligament derived from an artery, and then travels back up, recurs to connect to the larynx. Note, see figure 19. 
it winds up being three feet long. In giraffes, the nerve takes a similar path, but one that runs all the way down that long neck and back up again, a distance fifteen feet longer than the direct route. When I first heard about this strange nerve, I had trouble believing it. Wanting to see for myself, I mustered up my courage to make a trip to the human anatomy lab and inspect my first corpse. An obliging professor showed me the nerve, tracing its course with a pencil down the torso and back up to the throat. This circuitous path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is not only poor design but might even be maladaptive. That extra length makes it more prone to injury. It can, for example, be injured by a blow to the chest, making it hard to talk or swallow. But the pathway makes sense when we understand how the recurrent laryngeal nerve evolved. Like the mammalian aorta itself, it descends from those branchial arches of our fish-like ancestors. In the early fish-like embryos of all vertebrates, the nerve runs from top to bottom alongside the blood vessel of the sixth branchial arch. It is a branch of the larger, vagus nerve that travels along the back from the brain. And in adult fish, the nerve remains in that position, connecting the brain to the gills and helping them pump water. During our evolution, the blood vessel from the fifth arch disappeared, and the vessels from the fourth and sixth arches moved downward into the future torso, so that they could become the aorta and a ligament connecting the aorta to the pulmonary artery. But the laryngeal nerve, still behind the sixth arch, had to remain connected to the embryonic structures that became the larynx, structures that remained near the brain. As the future aorta evolved backward toward the heart, the laryngeal nerve was forced to evolve backward along with it. It would have been more efficient for the nerve to detour around the aorta, breaking and then reforming itself on a more direct course. But natural selection couldn't manage that, for severing and rejoining a nerve is a step that reduces fitness. To keep up with the backward evolution of the aorta, the laryngeal nerve had to become long and recurrent, and that evolutionary path is recapitulated during development, since as embryos we begin with the ancestral, fish-like pattern of nerves and blood vessels. In the end, we're left with bad design. Courtesy of evolution, human reproduction is also full of jerry-rigged features. We've already learned that the descent of male testes a result of their evolution from fish gonads, creates weak spots in the abdominal cavities that can cause hernias. Males are further disadvantaged because of the poor design of the urethra, which happens to run right through the middle of the prostate gland that produces some of our seminal fluid. To paraphrase Robin Williams, it's a sewage pipe running directly through a recreation area. A large fraction of males develop enlarged prostates later in life, which squeeze the urethra and make urination difficult and painful. Presumably this wasn't a problem during most of human evolution, when few men lived past thirty. A smart designer wouldn't put a collapsible tube through an organ prone to infection and swelling. It happened this way because the mammalian prostate gland evolved from tissue in the walls of the urethra. Women don't fare much better. They give birth through a pelvis, a painful and inefficient process that, before modern medicine, killed appreciable numbers of mothers and babies. The problem is that as we evolved a big brain, the infant's head became very large relative to the opening of the pelvis, which had to remain narrow to allow efficient bipedal, two-legged walking. This compromise leads to the difficulties and enormous pain of human birth. If you designed a human female, wouldn't you have rerouted the female reproductive tract so it exited through the lower abdomen instead of the pelvis? Imagine how much easier it would be to give birth. But humans evolved from creatures that laid eggs or gave live birth, less painfully than we, through the pelvis. We're constrained by our evolutionary history. And would an intelligent designer have created the small gap between the human ovary and fallopian tube? so that an egg must cross this gap before it can travel through the tube and implant in the uterus? Occasionally, a fertilized egg doesn't make the leap successfully and implants in the abdomen. This produces an abdominal pregnancy, almost invariably fatal to the baby and without surgery to the mother. 
the gap is a remnant of our fish and reptilian ancestors who shed eggs directly from the ovary to the outside of their bodies. The fallopian tube is an imperfect connection because it evolved later as an add-on in mammals. Some creationists respond that poor design is not an argument for evolution, that a supernatural intelligent designer could nevertheless have created imperfect features. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, the ID proponent, Michael Behe, claims that features that strike us as odd in a design might have been placed there by the designer for a reason for artistic reasons, for variety, to show off, for some as yet undetectable practical purpose, or for some unguessable reason, or they might not. But this misses the point. Yes, a designer may have motives that are unfathomable, but the particular bad designs that we see make sense only if they evolved from features of earlier ancestors. If a designer did have discernible motives when creating species— one of them must surely have been to fool biologists by making organisms look as though they evolved.